tonight we have a really special program and Steve McGuire, who's standing next to me, is going to do the presentation. And I know Steve from way back because he's done presentations at the library on storytelling. Since I was four now. Yeah. It's a long time. Yeah, and I was yeah. zero, so yeah. that far back. So anyway, Steve has a, um, now teaches a class on fabrication and design about bicycle building, and I'm just going to turn it over to him. I'll give you a little history of how um, I got to where I got and um, what it takes, what goes on with building a bike. Okay? What I have with me this evening are images uh, from what we did do in terms of fabrication at the university with the bike and also uh, some images from the North American Handbuilt Bike Show. Uh, the largest event of its kind in the United States, uh, premier event actually internationally. And for the past three years, I've taken university students, uh, a lot of engineering students, art students who uh, make their own bicycles, exhibit. Um, for them, it's a great experience. Um, one of the things that they get to do is have conversations with people who admire the work that they did. And uh, that's just, it's a terrific opportunity for somebody to come up and say, I just love your bike. The other uh, thing that they get to do is meet some of the people who build the bikes that they've looked at and admired and drooled over for years. So best fabricators are there. Some people may be familiar, uh, two years ago, we got some of those best frame builders to exhibit their bikes in Iowa City in the downtown area. So Ken Erickson, uh, Stephen Belinke, uh, James Blakely, um, Steve Potts, uh, all exhibited bikes in Iowa City. And in fact, Ken Erickson's bike, which was in active endeavors, uh, was sold to somebody in Iowa City, and I don't know who, but they paid a hefty price. It was just over $10,000 for the bike. So beautiful bike. Uh, we bring those people to Iowa City. Uh, and I try to bring somebody who is a significant frame builder uh, in the spring to the University of Iowa. We've had Steve Potts, who was fabulous. James Blakely actually comes every year from Colorado. His son is actually coming to the University of Iowa uh, uh, to study engineering. So. Um, okay, formerly at uh, Studio Arts in uh, the old Menards building, we're now in the new Visual Arts building on campus, and we genuinely have a kind of bicycle lab. So it is really set up in terms of metal fa fabrication and one of two prototyping studios to be able to do the process that we need in order to fabricate. I like this image because uh, it illustrates uh, some of the creativity that sometimes is required to make something happen. We have four different tube benders. The one that they're actually operating uh, is used for chain stays, but they're doing something a little bit different on it. And you can see the additional levered bar, and they're just trying to make it work. So I got a, I got a kick out of it. Uh, each year, uh, I do the course twice. Uh, actually, I do two courses each semester, one an advanced course, one uh, the beginning course. In the advanced course, almost always people make titanium bicycle frames. I explain to people that uh, there's a lot of um, mystique around uh, the welding of titanium. But in fact, uh, titanium is, I think, an easier metal to weld and work with uh, as long as you follow the proper uh, sequence and procedures for making sure that you keep uh, uh, everything oxygen depleted in terms of the environment. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, I'll, I'll say more about why I think that's the case. OK, so let me go through. So what I have this evening is a bicycle that we made in the spring. And I'm going to talk about how I go about uh, building a bike. And it's not too dissimilar uh, from how we begin the class each semester. 
first thing that I do is ask myself, what am I going to use the bicycle for? Where am I going to ride it? Um, you know, what's the intended purpose? I've taken uh, a lot of trips on bicycles, three times down the coast and back to Iowa City, a couple times from Fairbanks, Alaska, back to Iowa, a lot of ultra events, uh, 24, 36, 48, seven day uh, uh, trips on a bicycle. And anymore, that's what I do. A lot of times, um, well, right now, I, I somewhat jokingly, but it's true, for me, racing season has begun. As Dave will know, who's uh, gone with us to northern Minnesota and Wisconsin. So I do ultra events in the winter. Uh, some of those take anywhere from 24 to, to 36 hours. And the bikes that I build as of late uh, are for that purpose. And a lot of the design uh, that um, I pursue is, is in that vein. Are there questions so far? Anybody? Yes, the question? Is there still a bicycle from Black Sheep Bikes at the Art Museum? There is still a bicycle from Black Sheep Bikes at the museum. And the bicycle that there ha that's there has, um, has an interesting story. Um, James Blakely uh, has uh, almost annually uh, won an award at the North American Handbuilt Bike Show. He is such a good welder that uh, for folks from, Bull uh, from Boeing uh, who fabricate have come to see him weld. Uh, but he's one for design, he's one for welding, he's one for different things. So that year, uh, the museum commissioned him to build a bike. And the bike that he built, he exhibited, and it actually got best of show. So there's a little provenance with the bike that's in the museum. And what was interesting to me is this bicycle that was made to be ridden in a very rugged place can only be handled with white gloves because it's a, a museum. <laughs> the university has actually begun uh, to pursue a bicycle, a hand-built bicycle uh, collection. This summer I actually came across a 1968 uh, uh, bamboo bike built in Vietnam, and, uh, and that's going in. So, okay, so other questions? This is this bike, that's right. You know, there's a couple of other uh, changes. I mean, I, I know that I ended up making the chain stays a little bit longer. Let, let me talk about the, the purpose of this bike. Um, in the winter, uh, when I'm riding uh, in an event, uh, because I'm an old guy, and I only ride a single speed, I, I really like that, uh, I, am always navigating the tracks that are on the trail that other people ahead of me have left. And very often, the snow is soft enough that I'm uh, washing out either the back or uh, you know, having to get on and get off the bike very quickly. Because I'm a single speed, uh, because I'm riding single speed, a lot of times I have to jump off the bike and be able to push up the hill. So, the, the things that I did with this geometry was I lowered the standover so that when I fall, and inevitably I fall several times, uh, or when I hop off, there's very easy clearance. Uh, the other thing I did was I extended the rear, uh, the, the chain stay and the seat stay so the rear end is a little bit longer and the overall length of the bike is a little bit longer uh, because it, doing that, uh, gives it kind of the effect of a keel. It, it makes the bike track better in the tracks that have already been left, if that makes sense. So um, I do that. The other thing that I did, I lowered um, my bottom bracket height so that my bottom bracket, uh, by being lower, lowers my center of gravity. One thing I point out to students is that in the course, they're able to make a bicycle for the place that they're going to ride it. Um, 
a lot of times I'll ask a university student, uh, where are you going to live after you graduate? Because the bicycle will be that way. Today, for instance, I had a student that was dead set. They're going to move to Colorado. They want to ride the trails. Their bottom bracket height is uh, around just over 13 inches because of that. For me, I'll put my bottom bracket height uh, on this bike at about, uh, the, the, with the smallest tire that I'll use in there, it'll be about 11.7 inches or 11.9 in there. So it's a little bit less than you would find on a typical fat bike if you were to go down to uh, a shop and get that. And that's because in Iowa, uh, I don't need to worry about pedal strike. It's just not going to happen for the kind of riding that I do. Does that make sense? So, um, other questions? Yes? Notice, like a really wide hub spacing. Why are you running that if you're not running like four or five inch tire? Okay, so uh, good observation. So what I have on here is, uh, is very, when he says hub spacing, what he actually is referring to is the width of this hub. Over the past five years, uh, the, uh, the, the standards for bicycle hub width for all kinds of elements of a bicycle have radically changed and they've become quite numerous. There was a time where you had a 130 or 132 bottom or hub width if you were a road and you had a 135 for everything else. With the uh, advent or onset of fatter wheels, you needed a stronger wheel which required uh, having a pitch on the wheel build that put the spokes further out, and that meant increasing the, hub, increasing the hub width. At the same time, you began to increase the tire width. So the question is why? At the end of the day, it's because I um, only have so much money, so I switch out wheels. So I run a 4.8 uh, set of tires in here, and I run these 3-inch uh, on here. I've thought about running, uh, it would look really funny, and that's why I would do it, uh, some road wheels on here to see how it would look. And then the other thing that I do on this frame, and it's built this way for a purpose, I have two single speed wheels. So I have a single speed wheel up front, single speed wheel in back, and I can switch those wheels out if I need to. And I, I usually do it for um, uh, this reason. In the winter, during an event, uh, I've noticed that the conditions of the trail and the snow can be radically different over, say, 150 miles. Uh, it can also snow during an event. One area might uh, uh, melt a little bit. The, everything changes very quick in terms of riding conditions in a, in a winter event in the way that they don't in another event. And so. Uh, I want to be able to have something to bail out with. So I'll, I'll shoot to begin the race with a specific cog that allows me to pedal at a pace that I think will, will work. And then I will have a big cog, I don't have that right now, in the front that's a kind of bailout so that I can pedal in just about anything, if that makes sense. Other questions? So it becomes two speed. Yes, it's really two speeds. That's right. It's a very slow derailleur <laughs> is what it is. But, you know, the thing that I, I um, there are just so many uh, metaphors for uh, why to ride a single speed. But for me, I'm actually faster because I'm forced to pace myself. So in some events, my fastest time is on a single speed. Um, I'll spin out because I'll run out of gear, or you know the other side, I'll have to really stand up and pedal hard to get up the hill. And the other is I walk. Walking is part of riding a single speed, and, and that's okay with me. So I'm gonna talk about this bike uh, very specifically. Uh, the bicycle, I did this with James Blakely, Black Sheep. Uh, his son called it the Desplosion Fork. It's got a kind of cool name, and the reality is there's only two of these forks. James has one, I've got one. 
The reason why is uh, we're in the beta testing phase. <laughs> Nobody wants to die. And the other is that, call it, go ahead and call it desplosion, just to make sure that people think or pause before they, they do it. But the fork has, has been terrific. Um, just this past August 1st, I completed uh, this Trans-South Dakota race. And uh, it was quite the adventure. I averaged about three hours of sleep a night. I uh, learned to use my Garmin 1000 in a way I'd not ever have to navigate before because so much of the event was actually uh, through rangeland where you could not tell if there was a trail. You were headed to a point. And, um, but quite the event. And I used this fork uh, in that event. This fork does, it's, it, the thing to know about bicycles, uh, nothing is new under the sun. The basic uh, geometry of a bicycle was figured out uh, right at the beginning, right when they added um, uh, pedals uh, to a bicycle. Nothing has hardly changed. So that if you look back at the US, in, in the US Patent Office, you will see the same linkage, more or less, that uh, a full tail suspension bike, like specialized stump jumper, it was already done way back in the day. Uh, everything since that time has been uh, in pursuit of using new materials and, uh, and new engineering around components and materials. So really the basic geometry has always been here. So this fork is uh, tried and true in terms of uh, what people have done over the decades uh, in terms of trying to incorporate some suspension. This fork actually works, I, maybe this isn't the, act, the, the best word, but I'm going to use it now because it helps. It's really good for a kind of catastrophic hit. So if I jump off something, this will flex quite a bit. And uh, then it really takes up the shock absorption. There is, there is just... There is so much science around bicycling and how to make things work. But this fork has uh, a, a lot, a lot of head scratching into it. Most forks, uh, almost all forks, have their dampening uh, uh, capacity determined by deflection. Usually the deflection is moving fore and aft. When you're... Um, uh, when you're riding hard into a corner, you actually want to reduce the amount of movement in that fork uh, when you're going side to side uh, laterally. So the goal is always to make the, the shock absorption happen straight up and down, uh, retain the compliance, and at the same time give it uh, lateral rigidity. So what this fork does is absorb uh, the shock really through these plates, and uh, it retains the deflection fore and aft so that it's just a, a more focused uh, compliance, if, if you will. The material here is titanium. And uh, I, I, you know, uh, the thing about bicycles and fabrication, and I've really come to appreciate this, is um, if you're going to spend your time making something, make it, f make it something that's going to last potentially a lifetime. And there are, two, uh, there are two for sure lifetime materials, steel and titanium. Uh, aluminum is a metal, but it has a life. It has a fatigue life. Uh, carbon is a great material, and its strength uh, is, uh, is uncompromising, but it has its limitations. If you, uh, if you crack that carbon, you can maybe mess with it. I wouldn't trust it, and uh, you sure can't weld it and put it back into place. So, you know, I, I think of bicycles, steel and titanium, as lifetime objects, things that can go with you. And after that, it's a matter of uh, being able to keep in your basement, like I do, parts that I have parts way, going way back, 
uh, that I can fit on just about everything. And people get a kick out of me. They'll say, uh, I'm looking for one of these, and I don't know where I can get one. I'll say, come down in the basement. And the basement has everything. But um, so titanium is a lifetime material. When uh, we begin to design, like I said, we identify what we're going to uh, what we're going to use the bike for. The second thing that we do is determine fit. And uh, this, is, this is something that I, I really like about uh, the bikes that the students produce. They are able to make a bicycle that fits them. Uh, riding a bike that fits you for the purpose that you've, that you've made it, there is, there's just very few experiences like that. It's just... It, it feels like hand and glove. And um, I don't know that students notice that because they won't have ridden as much, but very simple things. So for instance, um, I had a student last spring, uni. Uh, I think she's gonna be president of the world someday. She's now in graduate school in Australia. Uh, we worked with Head Bicycle, Head Cycling up in Minnesota. And they began to, they did some research on 24 inch uh, uh, fat tires uh, and um, uh, the energy uh, required around inertia. So 24 inch wheels actually, in their research, reduced, uh, had 30% less uh, challenge in terms of making those wheels go on a fat bike. Well, what it did for her, since she wasn't quite five feet tall, is it allowed her to make a bicycle that uh, was a fat bike that fit her. A lot of times, people who, uh, nobody, nobody has made their body for every bike that's there. Ideally, you would have a bike that's made to your fit, if that makes sense. So for her, you know, we can change the, the top tube height, so the standover, uh, allows for that, those kinds of things. Does that make sense? Are there questions so far? Yes. Can you make that flex by pushing on it, or is it not that? Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard, but you can see it. So you really have to come down and so you see it, but you've still got some there now. The other thing that I do, uh, because I'm riding, uh, always riding long distances, um, I try to locate uh, other places that I could put uh, shock absorption or, or more compliance, and I do that in the handlebars. So th these are kind of fancy fun. I call them the Mad Rhino bars because uh, they've got these two bullets on it, and I've got a friend named Mad Rhino. Uh, the, uh, so the idea for this is that when I'm riding single speed, I'm always pulling up when I'm standing up, coming up the hill. So this really allows me to leverage. At the same time, uh, it goes so far out, 760 millimeters, that it uh, adds a degree of shock absorption. So it's very comfortable. If you've never ridden a titanium seat post, your idea of comfort, if you put that on, will change. Does anybody ride titanium? It's just incredible. You've got uh, uh, a lot of good compliance movement. The thing about titanium is it has 80% more elongation than steel, and steel itself is already uh, very compliant. But titanium uh, retains uh, its, its form through the whole thing. What, I, what it might have been intriguing if I would have brought this here uh, uh, is that this plate. So right here, I use this plate on the bike because it allows me to uh, work in all the tight compliances that are required to fit around a, a, a fat tire, to get the chain ring in there, and everything. So this is where the water jet comes in. So this was cut with a water jet. Well, where this originally comes from is in the use of full suspension. So in a full suspension bike, we'll put a shock right here, and that's it. This will allow three inches of travel and retain its, its, uh, its form. So just like a regular bike, but you're using the elongation properties of titanium uh, to be able to pull it off. So it's, it's good. Um, so, yes? Say that again. You're going to get three inches where? 
three inches of travel through this flex plate. So it's a quarter inch thick, so you get this travel. And um, yeah, this way or up? up and down. So just like you were to have a full, when you have a full yeah. suspension bike. Yeah, so the shock will be here. It'll attach to the rear, so it won't be. We gotta get a slow-mo back. What's that? Yeah, I, you know, it's, Dave has, has seen me execute this before, but uh, it's, it's very intriguing. And the reason why I did it is because I ride a single speed. So if I use a linkage, is there a, a linkage being all the things that make that uh, uh, suspension work in the back, it changes the length of the chain as it goes through its motion. If I don't put the linkage in, I retain the, the same length of the chain through the entire arc, and that allows me to run a single speed. And so that's, that's the reason why, if that makes sense. I'm not the, I'm the first person to ever think of that, but I'm always looking for how people have solved problems. And the thing about bicycles is everybody has tried something. And the internet has changed fabrication dramatically because people can share ideas, and they do all the time. I, in the class, especially with the advanced class, I've got four students right now who are in the advanced class, uh, 12 in the beginning class, and the advanced students are having conversations with people all over the globe on little idiosyncratic uh, concepts, trying to figure out how that works, and they bring that right back in, and I've never heard of them before, but we can try some things out, if that makes sense. So, okay, I'm going to show some more images. How, how do you handle the switching wheels with different sizes? Oh, this is a good question. So, so, when you ride a single speed, you have to have some kind of chain tensioning uh, system. Here uh, is a sliding dropout, so it moves for, forward and aft. So with the different cog size, I can simply move that. Now, I, I tell um, engineering students especially, uh, this, the manufacturer who makes this dropout, Paragon Machine Works in California, uh, was uh, so brilliant. Right now, we're all becoming a little bit more familiar with uh, modular design processes where uh, the design is adaptable for new standards that are introduced in the future. So this dropout has been around for a couple of decades. Even as the, uh, the hub uh, uh, dropout and dimensions have changed, the same basic thing works because there's a piece that just slots in. So they change uh, and create new pieces, but the dropout itself works. So the other thing you can do is just um, a spring tensioner that's on there, if that makes sense. So. Steve, are those 29 inch wheels? Is that the ideal diameter for the types of races? So I rode 29 or plus for a while, uh, with, which would be a 700C wheel, a road wheel, but with a, a wider tire. And then this year I went to 27 and a half, which is 650B. So the reason why I did that is because I barely changed my bottom bracket height. So a 650B wheel, uh, 27 and a half, with a three inch tire is 734 millimeters in diameter. A four inch fat tire on a 26 inch 85 millimeter rim is 734 millimeters. So when I switch out wheels, there's absolutely no difference in the bottom bracket height. I really wouldn't worry about it when I have 29 or plus, but I will, um, let's see, 734, 774, uh, 40 millimeters. So I would raise this up almost an entire inch, which with the 29 inch wheels or with that, that really will change how it feels when it rides. So with the 27 and a half, I was in pursuit of keeping my bottom bracket the same height and uh, the wheels actually are, are pretty quick because they're just a little bit lighter. I, I don't have my fat bike here. Uh, if you wanted, I, if you're ever doing it, 
Right now, uh, faculty show in the new art building. I have my one of my bikes are in that fat show, but my four inch uh, wheel set are lighter than these. And I work with head cycling. Um, and it's just, it's amazing. Uh, you pick up the wheel and you're just like, what? <laughs> uh, and it works. So the other thing is, I have Iowa cut out. Okay. I have Iowa cut out with water jet. So uh, jokingly, in the School of Art and Art History, there's uh, this concept of the Iowa idea. And it's, um, there's, there's a whole history with that. But we call some of the geometry that we do the Iowa idea. And so uh, we use this plate a lot. Uh, and it shows up in what we do. OK. The other is I work a lot with engineering. As it turns out, uh, <laughs> the courses that I teach are, are uh, part of the coursework now for engineering students in both in mechanical, civil, industrial, and biomedical. And um, the majority of my students now are engineering students. Uh, next uh, uh, Wednesday, Trek is coming uh, to uh, the university. Uh, Ryan has worked a lot with Trek. Um, but uh, interestingly, the head of US manufacturing found this snippet about uh, the courses, and they contacted us. And now they're taking uh, engineering students and art students as interns uh, in Wisconsin. And then um, we're doing different collaborative efforts, which is really intriguing uh, to me. It was, uh, it's, it's terrific for our students. Can I ask, can I ask yeah. a question about how art gets to in, to bicycle building? And you keep talking about you're an art professor, but right. you're doing engineering. OK, so I, I will tell you this. I, I first went to graduate school in sculpture. And then I went on and I got a PhD. I tell people that I use my graduate degree in sculpture uh, to do something really fun, and that is build bikes. So I have a fabrication background. Uh, but uh, what I've come to appreciate is that uh, they're really at, at the edge of art and engineering. There is absolutely no difference. You are in pursuit of an idea in order to see something that, uh, and make it clear so that you understand it better. I, mean, I look at building a bicycle as a way to explore the landscape, the terrain, uh, and it's in pursuit of that in the same way that you're making a piece of art uh, in pursuit of a concept, if that makes sense. So I, I don't see anything different between the two. And um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that in order to make things that are meaningful, you have to have skills. In order to uh, execute your skills, you have to be able to be in pursuit of something that has personal meaning. And bicycles have both of those. They require uh, a lot of practice, attention uh, to detail, and at the same time, to do it well, you have to have an idea that just takes hold that you're in pursuit of. Does that make sense? Yes, Don. I, just to, to add on to that, I started an undergraduate art program at Georgia State University and I took jewelry and so just thinking, you know, I just didn't, I didn't hear anything about what we were making, but it's funny because I'm building a bicycle, <laughs> which is essentially using the same yeah. skills. Yeah. You know, um, I, I have to, to say here, uh, a, a lot of everything that I know in terms of building a bike comes from one person, and that's Tom Teasdale. Tom Teasdale and I uh, were friends for a couple of decades. He passed away uh, a couple of summers ago. And uh, it, uh, it, it was an incredible loss. And the thing about Tom's passing and I think about this all the time. Everybody, you know, we live in this area, and we 
we have this idea of what we do in Iowa City that's cool, what we make. Uh, we're the city of literature. And what a lot of people didn't know is that in West Branch was one of the greatest frame builders in the United States, if not internationally. So if you go to Sweden and you go to their bicycle museum, you will see a Tom Teasdale frame. I can remember um, when uh, Tom died, uh, I called uh, Gary Fisher that afternoon and I reached him, um, he was in Australia, and I told him, and he and Tom had talked routinely once every week or once every two weeks. And I always got the, the kick out of this line. So Tom Ritchie is mad at Gary Fisher and in the moment says, the best thing that ever happened to you was Tom Teasdale. So Tom Teasdale built the original uh, Fisher uh, uh, racing frames. Those were built out in West Branch in a shed. Uh, so many, you know, th Tom wouldn't kill me if I said this because he admitted all the time, wasn't the best businessman, but he was brilliant when it came to using tools and knowing engineering. It just, it was incredible. Um, you know, there wasn't a week that went by that I did not go out to Tom's shop and just hang out and talk. And um, when I first began to teach the course, first thing that I did was brought in uh, my co-teacher, which is Professor Tom Teasdale. And uh, Tom just loved it. And Tom was terrific. So I, I, I mentioned to a couple of students, the last two lug frames that Tom made were made with students. And uh, I actually, I'm going to show you an image of not that frame, but one of the frames that one, one of those students made. But um, Tom just knew everything. I remember going to uh, Jerry, uh, um, a bicycle show that was really uh, about bicycles that had been uh, brought back, refurbished. Tom could look at a bottom bracket and tell you what city it was made in in 1938. That's the kind of knowledge that he had. So I always thought of him as a kind of living treasure. His knowledge was immense. Um, so with his passing was, um, was, was a lot of knowledge. So I learned a lot uh, from working with Tom. I learned uh, shortcuts. I learned that I could never make the shortcuts that Tom can. I, I use a mill and uh, a tube notcher to make the miters on the frame. Tom could just take a bench grinder and just like that make the miter by looking at it. It was, you just, how do you do that? He had done it so often, he just knew where to place his hand and how to do it. The cool thing too, he had a tube notcher and uh, it was set up with uh, two bicycle cranks and a derailleur. And when the kids were younger, they would pedal. And that's how the tube would be cut. And then he hooked it up to a washing machine, uh, old washing machine motor. And that's what he used to make all these frames. Uh, the museum's actually trying to work to acquire the original drawings that him and Gary produced to make those uh, original frames uh, for, for Fisher. You know. Was he self-taught in frame making? He was self-taught. And his background was in uh, physics and math. And uh, he, would, he could design a bike just by math. He work out different equations, tell you where things should be. It was just, it, he was so intriguing to watch. Uh, OK, so. Um, one of the things that the students have to learn right away is TIG welding. And um, TIG welding is um, it, it's, it's the kind of skill that if you acquire it, you are everybody's friend, right? You, you know, if there's a problem, somebody's trailer hitch, something like that, you are the man. Yeah. And uh, I love uh, when students, uh, uh, talk with their parents 
They send a photo. This is my weld. Her parents are like, what? You didn't do that. How did you learn how to do that? So uh, this is a student uh, tacking her frame. And I, these are, this is a frame jig. Uh, the frame jig has a kind of pedigree or history. It um, uh, was used at Boulder Bikes and at uh, Co-Motion. And then James Blakely, when he worked for Boulder Bikes, took that idea, made a jig himself. Then we did a couple of small modifications. We call them the black sheep jigs. So we've got 12 of these frame jigs. First semester that Tom and I taught six, six years ago, we had one frame jig and one welder, and we had 17 students. Mm -hmm. Now we have 12 students, 12 frame jigs, actually 13, with the anvil, and uh, three welders, two that are always set up, a backup one for the other, and that works really well. So this is what um, class looks like when we get our tubes. Um, we get our tubes, mostly uh, the tubes themselves, the frame tubes, from uh, Nova Cycle, double-butted chromoly uh, steel. Uh, the one thing that students have to learn how to do is uh, learn how to weld two tubes together that have uh, slightly different thicknesses, wall thicknesses. And when it comes to welding the, the, the top tube or the down tube to the head tube, this is necessarily thicker. So they have to learn where to point their torch. They, they have to really acquire that sensibility. And today was their first day of turning in their tiggy. And the tiggy is Tom's idea. This is how Tom taught me how to weld. You make an animal out of, uh, out of legs. Uh, a body, four legs, a neck, and a head. So the idea is that you do the miters to fit it all together. Tight miters make for good welds. If you don't have a good miter, you're not going to have a good weld. And uh, so the way to teach students the relationship between miter and welding is from the outset to get them to do that. And so. Each week, for their, uh, all the way until they're through their main triangle welding, they will hand in an animal once a week that they've welded. And it takes an incredible amount of practice. So right now, we've moved into the class where we're working on their full-scale drawing that they'll use to make their bike. And then at the same time, outside of class, they're spending about 10, 12 hours a week uh, with the torch uh, trying to get uh, that TIG welding down. And the good thing is um, they're young enough to just keep plugging at it. I've told them that, you know, we've had uh, over 80 students come in, take the course, and nobody has not learned how to weld. You just got to stick with it. You, when you start, you uh, you pretty much are convinced that you are going to be the one person that can never figure this out. <laughs> and then one day, uh, you run a little bit of a bead, and you're like, I'm good. <laughs> the next day, you cannot weld at all. And then all of a sudden, it links up. You know what you're seeing. You get used to the speed, the pulse, and you know how to move that thing through, right? Yeah. And so it's, um, I, but I'm, I'm just so pleased that students know how to use tools. If that makes sense, I, mean, I, I grew up, yeah. So I was wondering, are you when you're teaching them how to weld, are you using like a mild steel steel rod to teach them, or are you using a chromoly specific? I'm using 880T, which would be you know yeah. what they would use for the frame. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm it's having. A little bit harder to learn. Yeah. yeah. But I, I figure they might as well jump. They, they might as well jump right, out there. right in there. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's. It's, um, if they stick with it, they, they get it. And then we have the Tiggy Hall of Fame. So we have a shelf where we put up all the Tiggies, and then they get really fancy, and they'll take off one of the toenail cuts that are left after miter, and they'll make an ear off the head. Uh, then the legs will be, you know, one leg will be lifted, peeing on a fire hydrant, something like that. You know, there, there'll be all kinds of things. So what we do is um, we design our frame. 
then they have a material sheet that they have to fill out, and then we uh, we place our order. We get our um, our uh, frame pieces like uh, the bottom bracket, the head tube, uh, the dropouts from Paragon Machine Works in California, and then we uh, get our steel tubes from um, uh, Nova, as I had mentioned. Um, so it's first, you know, it's whole day everybody sorting out things uh, in terms of is that I think you've got my top tube, yeah. Nova's a supplier. And they, they don't necessarily make them themselves. They, make them they don't. You know, the thing that just happened, and I don't know if people are aware of this, Reynolds quit making uh, bicycle tubes. They had made um, bicycle tubes as an extension of their golf club manufacturing, and they decided they were done. I thought it was True Temper. Guys. Their True Temper, yeah, that they made, yeah. Is down, yeah. But Reynolds just decided that they were, and you know, the, there people are searching to try to figure out where we'll get a U.S. manufacturer. Uh, so there's Columbus, there's some others, but it's it's you know it doesn't. We're not at that high quality of tubing. There's some uh, true temper material that Tom used that only three people ever turned out to be in Reynolds' mind, certified as capable of using it. So he's, he was that good. So. Okay, the tube notcher. This is a workhorse, uh, and this is how we miter our tubes. You'll see on the wall in the back, we've got different uh, hole saws. We don't use fancy hole saw because we go through them quick, uh, so not a diamond tip, anything like that. Um, but we're mitering right here. Um, in terms of, uh, of making the cuts on that. The other thing we'll use is, uh, is a mill. Uh, I like using the mill because um, it's, uh, if you do it manually and you're working on the principle of axis, X, Y, uh, then you begin to, am I going, yeah, probably need to wrap it up in a minute. Okay, so you're, you're learning what you need to know in order to operate or the concepts of a... Uh, um, uh, CNC mill. So I'm going to go through some of these. There's a jig. So we've got jigs for different things. This is our uh, chain stay jig. By the way, I'll say this to everybody. I really like doing this. If you're ever interested in coming down and seeing us work, you're more than welcome to do it. We're 1030 on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, some days we're, you know, we're uh, simply doing some drawing right now. Other days we're working. But if you shoot me an email at s mcguire uiowaedu uh, we'll figure it out, and you can come down and, and see how we do this. Okay, very proud. Mark did a good job. So this is his front triangle. We'll begin with a front triangle, then we'll do the rear triangle. And I have a whole sequence of what tube to cut first, where to tack first, because you want to bring all these tubes together uh, and heat's involved uh, because of the welding. So you, you want to keep it as aligned as possible all the way through the entire process, as, if that makes sense. So you know, the other thing that students uh, are, and most of us, are not really familiar with is things don't happen the first time. You get out a file. So if you are working on this miter and this miter, they've got to be tight. They, they've got to be tight. They can't be just a little bit off. They've got to be tight. And Mark probably had to do this cut about eight times before he got it close enough that he could use a file. And then you need to know what it is that you're looking at to file to see where the high spot is. So it does take, um, it takes just a lot of persistence. So the first thing we do is the main triangle. Then we do the rear triangle. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm showing uh, the bike that's actually on exhibit that's 
uh, on a full-scale drawing. We use a full-scale drawing because in the middle of the process, you may need to get out your rule and measure something and then go back to your frame jig, if that makes sense. So you gotta, you work between the two. The other is some of these miters and cuts, uh, depending on the angle, you might have to reverse it so that you might have to reverse 63 degrees the other direction. So having it full scale, you're able to lay the tube on there and say, is it this way, is it this way? The other thing I, I tell students, and they, they learn pretty quick, work with a partner. I can remember Tom and I one day cut both the top tube and the down tube wrong together. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it happens. So you, you, you want somebody to say, now, wait, 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 wait. Are you sure you want to cut this? And that a lot of times when students, oh, what I do, it's really kind of, I, I shouldn't, but I think it's pretty funny. So the first time we'll cut one of their tubes. They'll have it set up in the jig, and they'll be drawing the tube notcher over, and I go, no, 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 and then they'll, what? And then, then we'll do it. It'll be all right. So they panic. So beautiful titanium frame that Connor made. And uh, this is the anvil jig. Very expensive jig. If I had uh, lots of money, I would get them, but this is a $5,000 jig. Now, we use this especially for titanium, though we can do it in the black sheep. Up at the top, you can see some of the fittings for uh, a purge tube. With a, when you're, you're welding uh, tungsten inert gas, TIG, uh, you're, uh, you're depleting the oxygen uh, around the torch so that there's no oxidation. That works great for steel just on the outside, but when it comes to titanium, you have to do it on the inside too. So we're pumping argon into the tube at the same time argon is coming out of the torch handle. Uh, so we've got um, uh, a regulator that's, that's dual. Uh, we've got a, a purge, um, that, that set there ready to go. So it's, it's, you know, and you just want to keep it all clean. That's really what you have to do. But with the titanium, you can make the welds look pretty. You make a root weld, unlike you do with steel, where you use no filler rod, but simply a fusion weld. So you're join, joining the two pieces together simply with the heat of the torch. Then you make a pass over the root weld with uh, a filler rod, and that filler rod is really what's adding the strength. Then, if you're like me, and you weld really bad, you get to try several times to make it look really pretty. You can't do that with steel. With steel, at some point, you've, uh, you've uh, ruined the structural integrity of the weld by making multiple passes. So with titanium, it's a lot more forgiving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the gas coming out is flammable and some is just creating that. It's really not, not flammable. Um, and you barely smell it, but we've got, you, you don't want to be in it all the time. We are, uh, we, we are exhausting the fumes. At the same time, the students will learn this, if you get a fan or a draft, it's going to move the argon away from the weld and you're not going to get uh, the torch to actually start. So, um, yeah, the argon is really there to deplete the environment more than anything, right? So, Steve Potts, the legend. <laughs> uh, Steve Potts, if you ever read about the, the origins of mountain biking, you see Mount Tam, go look up Steve Potts when you get home. Uh, Steve Potts came to university, he just, I mean, he is unbelievable. Uh, but uh, Steve's in California, does great work. Um, when he, um, he was here, he was just so good with students. The, the folks from uh, the physics lab who weld, uh, the dude, the NASA projects, they all came, came down to, to see him uh, work. And uh, James Blakely. The Desplosion Fork. 
This is that suspension system. So you see the plate down below. That's where that, that, that plate would flex. Students last year, because we had vacated uh, Studio Arts and we were finishing up, setting up their frames uh, outside, and they've already been powder coated. There's Kenny. What is it, the painting we, we do, most of it is powder coating, and we do it up at uh, Rainbow, but there are a couple places in Cedar Rapids that we do it. This, when they, you just hire that out, though, right? Yeah, we just hire that out. We, we could powder coat, but we don't have a big enough booth. And so, is that titanium? This is titanium, just yeah. raw titanium. And it just cleans up with a Scotch Bright pad. So it works good. Um, this bike, incredibly beautiful by Willie Tan, student. And he made this bike for uh, his sister, who is four foot seven. And it's a road bike, and it fits her perfectly. It's a touring bike. Uh, people were blown away at NAPS. They just could not believe that a student made this bike. Then he used original Campanola parts, and he uh, refurbished those parts, brought them back. It's just an incredible bike all the way around. Look at that. He made that fork. That's the beautiful lugged frame uh, all the way around. There they all are at NAMS. Traveling with this many students to Sacramento, California, everybody every night, Steve, are you going to go out with us? I'm going to bed. And, <laughs> but uh, they, were, they were great. And um, again, they, they had a great time. It is just, I, I really like the fact that they can go up to Ken Erickson and they can talk to Ken Erickson about what he does. I, we have students working with these people. Uh, Kevin Chamberlain, who graduated, Kent Erickson wanted him to work for him and somebody else. So it's, it's really quite fun for me to have these students going out and working for these uh, great fabricators. I have a, this video. I, Ken Erickson is the founder of Moots. But I have this great video of Josh, who's all the way on the left, riding a tandem 36-inch wheeled bike, titanium, with Kent Erickson through the NABS uh, convention. And that's the end of the slideshow. So it, you're always welcome to come down. Probably good to shoot me an email. I'll let you know what's going on. Uh, my sense is we're going to just keep on doing this. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to go to, to uh, the Philly Expo, probably the second biggest event in the country, and talk about uh, this. Um, we're the first university that NABS has brought on, which is a really good thing. Uh, and then the plan is to also go this year. Uh, we'll go to NABS in March in Salt Lake City, and then we're going to go to Bristol, England, to the UK Handbuilt Bike Show and uh, see how that is. So really thank you for coming this evening, and please email me if you've got questions and want to follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.